Hi everyone, today I'm going to be presenting a very small pile of possibilities for the quarter three of the Historathon 2023 Readathon, and this um, quarter of the year focuses on the years 1500 through 1800, so basically the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, the Scientific Revolution, the Age of Kings, just basically things like that, and obviously there are a couple of other books you can see in the pile that are not related to the Historathon Readathon, but I will be um, saving them for the last and it's kind of cool I thought I'd show you guys I did do it in my most um recent what's cheering me up right now unboxing video but I used this um really really cool new um Cerberus three-headed bunny bag for my library bag when I was getting the books the other day isn't this just so freaking cool a three-headed bunny and this is um Cerberus Cerber Bun Cerber Bunny himself isn't this so freaking cool he guards all my um little Flute, particularly since I have no t so many um, stuffed rabbits now from plushy dreadful. So anyway, let's just get down with it. This is um number one. Oh, and by the way, I was just randomly browsing browsing the stacks for history and geography and social sciences, I guess, and stuff like that to find these books. I didn't have a like a specific reading list in mind when I got to the library. And this is um How to Be a Tutor: A Dawn to Dusk Guide to Tutor Life by Ruth Goodman. And obviously, you have to be living under a rock to not know just how freaking popular the tutors are, particularly in historical fiction. Like, oh, wow, yet an, another historical fiction book about one of Henry VIII's wives or the other women in his life. So obviously, the, I never really got into that trend myself. English history, I'm sorry if this is offending anyone who does really passionately love it, but it's just really never been my thing. But I guess this book just kind of spoke to me because I love learning about everyday life in the past, even if those people were you know, rich and famous and stuff like that and this is talking about you know again I hate when the library does this they put the freaking sticker over the synopsis on the back and you can't see some of it so based for one I can make out on the heels of her triumphant how to do something like uh, blocking out the title could you please be a little more considerate Ruth Goodman travels even further back in English history oh I guess it was how to be a Victorian I can see a little bit so Ruth Goodman travels even further back in English history to the era closest to her heart, the dramatic period from the crowning of Henry VIII, I'm sorry, Henry VII, to the death of Elizabeth I. A celebrated master of British social and domestic history, Goodman draws on her own adventures living in recre recreated Tudor conditions to serve as our intrepid guide to 16th century living, proceeding from daybreak to bedtime. This immersive, engrossing slate work pays tribute to the lives of those who labored through the era, from using soot from candle wax to, as toothpaste, to, to, make, to malting grain for homemade ale, from the gruesome sport of bear baiting, to cook holding and cross-dressing, the madcap habits and revealing intimacies of life from the time of Shakespeare are vividly tender to the insatiably curious. And I do apologize, I should have mentioned this at the beginning for the fairly bad lighting and the noise outside, it's raining and thundering, obviously you can't really control the weather, particularly because I'm not, you know, really in control of where and when I cannot film when I'm not in my own home. And this is the second one I saw. It was in the new books section in um, fiction, The Lost Journals of Saka Juia by um, Deborah Magpie Erling. And I hope I'm not disappointed in this. So many times of, in recent years, I've been so disappointed when I'm seeing historical fiction about real people because these, like, the authors seem to take way too many liberties, give them, you know, like, modern sensibilities, like even the most like, radical against the grain person would have still operated within certain parameters or they like completely make up people who the person never knew in real life. Like that, you can do that fine in alternative history, particularly, you know, if the person starts out young or whatever, you're radically changing the course of his or her life. But I just really don't like when authors and doing like so-called straight historical fiction, they just like invent people who never really lived. So anyway, you probably most people know who Sacagawea was. She was the Native American guide for the American travelers on um, Lewis, Lewis and Clark in the very early 19th century. And here is the synopsis. Among the most memorialized women in American history, Sacagawea served as an interpreter and guide for Lewis and Clark's Corps of Discovery. In this visionary novel, acclaimed indigenous author Deborah Magpie Erling brings this, this mytholo mythologized figure vividly to life casting unsparing light on the men who brutalized her and recentering Sacagawea as the arbiter of her own history. Raised among the Lemhi Shoshone, in this retelling, the young Sacagawea is bright and bold, growing strong from the hard work of learning all ways to survive, gathering berries, water, roots, and wood, butchering buffalo, 
antelope and deer, not my thing at all, weaving baskets and listening to the stories of her elders. When her village is raided and her beloved Ape and Bia are killed, Saka Julia is kidnapped and then gambled away to Charbonneau, a French Canadian trapper. Heavy with grief, Saka Julia learns how to survive at the edge of a strange new world, teeming with fur trappers and traders. When Lewis and Clark's expedition party arrives, Saka Julia knows she must cross a vast and brutal terrain with her newborn son, the white man who owns her, and a company of men who wish to conquer and commodify the world she loves. Written in lyrical, dreamlike prose, the lost journals of Saka Julia is an astonishing work of art and a powerful tale of perseverance, the indigenous woman's story that hasn't been told. Well, obviously, this isn't a nonfiction book, which doesn't really fit the prompt, but it was, or it is about a real person, so I guess it could kind of fit in there, and obviously is in the same time period. This I'll save this for later because it's not part of the historathon, um, readathon, and this is, uh, again, an, another thing I found in the history section about that era of time. In particular, I liked it because, you know, women's history, I'm a second wave, I'm radical feminist. It's, that's really, really something important to me, you know, how we see the world. So I absolutely, you know, love like women's history and our culture and sociology and all sorts of fun stuff like that, particularly because so many women, I'm sorry, before that noise have been just like basically written out of history or they're just, their accomplishments have been down played or people just didn't know about them because they just were not born biologically male. And so this is In the Shadow of the Empress by Nancy Goldstone, author of Daughters of the Winter Queen, and it's the subtitle, The Defiant Lives of Mo Maria Theresa, Mother of Mo Marie Antoinette and Her Daughters. The vibrant, sprawling saga of Empress Maria Theresa, one of the most renowned women rulers in history, and three of her extraordinary daughters. Out of the thrilling and tempestuous 18th century comes the sweeping family saga of beautiful Maria Theresa, a sovereign of uncommon strength and vision, the only woman ever to inherit and rule the vast Habsburg Empire in her own name, and three of her remarkable daughters, lovely, talented Maria Christina, Governor General of the Austrian Netherlands, spirited Maria Carolina, the resolute Queen of Naples, and the youngest, Marie Antoinette, the glamorous, tragic queen of France, and perhaps the most famous princess in history, unfolding against an irresistible backdrop of brilliant courts from Vienna to Versailles. Embracing the exotic lure of Naples and Sicily, this epic history of Maria Theresa and her daughters is a tour de force of desire, adventure, ambition, treachery, sorrow, and glory. Each of these women's lives was packed with passion and heart-stopping suspense. Maria Theresa inherited her father's throne at the age of 23, and was immediately attacked on all sides by foreign powers, confident that a woman would be too weak to defend herself. Maria Christine, Christina, a gifted artist who, alone among her sisters, succeeded in marrying for love, would face the same dangers that destroyed the monarchy in France. Resourceful Maria Carolina would usher in the golden age of Naples, only to face the deadly whirlwind of Napoleon. And finally, Marie Antoinette, the doomed queen whose stylish excesses and captivating notoriety have masked the truth about her husband and herself for 250 years. Vividly written and deeply researched, In the Shadow of the Empress is the riveting story of four exceptional women who changed the course of history. Oh, and the author has written six previous books also about powerful women through history, The Daughters of the Winter Queen, Rival Queens, The Maid and the Queen, Four Queens, and The Lady Queen. So this is going to be something really fun to look forward to. And this is another book about like, powerful women in history, Game of Queens, The Women Who Made 16th Century Europe by Sarah Bristol. 16th Century Europe saw an explosion of female rule. Awesome. Whether they were on the throne or behind the scenes, women held unprecedented power for more than a hundred years. From Isabella of Castile, her daughter Catherine of Aragon, and her granddaughter Mary Tudor, to Catherine de Medici, Anne Boleyn, and Elizabeth Tudor, these women wielded enormous authority over their territories shaping the course of European history. Isabella of Castile, armor-clad, followed her soldiers onto the battlefield. Margaret of Austria and Louise of Savoy, two queen regents, put an end to years of war with their ladies' peace. Anne Boleyn was raised in Margaret of Austria's court, surrounded by powerful women. Her daughter, Elizabeth Tudor, grew up to be one of the most famous queens in history. Across boundaries and generations, these royal women were mothers and daughters, mentors and protégés, allies and enemies. For the first time, Europe saw a sisterhood of women who exercised their authority in a uniquely feminine in uniquely feminine ways that would not be equaled until modern times. 
at once a fascinating book biography and a thrilling political epic, Game of Queens explores the lives of some of the most beloved and reviled queens in history. From the rise of this age of queens to its eventual collapse, one thing was certain, Europe would never be the same. And this is, oh, um, and now I've gone to the books that have nothing to do with the historathon readathon. Hopefully you will continue watching and are interested in these titles as well. This was on the display of the library is having, you know, I've mentioned in many previous videos throughout the year, they do certain things by like, you know, topic, like for example, there's a super moon coming up or some other ast astronomical event. Here's some books about astronomy and space or going around the world and we're going to feature country by country or people born in this month or people whose names start with this letter. And I, obviously this is again near and dear to my heart because I'm, you know, a second wave radical feminist, you know, daring to drive a Saudi woman's awakening by Manal al-Sharif. And I, you know, do care very much about the fight for my sisters globally to have the same rights. Unfortunately, many girls and women seem to be taking for granted in the Western hemisphere these days, you know, like the basic right to vote, to drive, go out in public without a male chaperone, anything like that. It's just, you know, unfortunately, many women under a certain age, they just like don't realize what the world was like. I mean, obviously I'm under the age of 50 myself, but I like, I'm so, so grateful to my foremothers for, you know, campaigning and fighting and struggling for so, so many like decades and centuries. So I could have the, you know, rights that I kind of, you know, took for granted myself, like, you know, going to get like a higher education, being able to drive, not having to have a husband to have a life, just all sorts of things like that. And so anyway, this is a memoir about living, loving, dreaming, daring, and driving while female in a country where it's dangerous to do all of the above. Manal al-Sharif grew up in Mecca, the second daughter of a taxi driver, born the year strict fundamentalism took hold. In her adolescence, she was a religious radical, melting her brother's boy band CDs in the oven because music was haram, forbidden by Islamic law. But what a difference an education can make. By her 20s, she was a computer security engineer, one of the few women working in a desert compound built to resemble suburban America. That's when the Saudi kingdom's contradictions became too much to bear. She was labeled a slut for chatting with male colleagues. Her school-aged brother chaperoned her on a business trip. And while she kept a car in her garage, she was forbidden from driving on Saudi streets. Manal al-Sharif has written a fiercely intimate memoir about the making of an accidental activist, a vivid story of a young Muslim woman who stood up to a kingdom of men and one, daring to drive as a remarkable celebration of resilience in the face of tyranny, the extraordinary power of education and female solidarity, and the difficulties and joys of taking the driver's seat of your own destiny. In particular, this is important for me, besides being obviously about a female and feminist issues. I didn't learn to drive until I was 25 years old, because obviously my car accident, even before then, I lived in very walkable cities, and that had also very good bus systems. Like I was not living in suburban housing developments until somewhere in my when my family moved back to the Albany area when, when I was in my um, early 20s. So basically, like, I finally had to learn to drive, but I did, do look forward to, once again, living in a 15-minute walkable city with good public transportation because, like, you do not need a car to survive rant over. And this is the next one on the list. It was, I guess, a yeah, display of book, books about cats. I absolutely love cats. I help with taking care of several, like, darling community cats here. A Cat's Tale, A Journey Through Feline History by Baba the Cat, as dictated to Paul Kudu, Kudu Naris. It's a Greek name. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. And it's just obviously a really, oh, and there's also lots of illustrations, just like looking at history through a cat's eye, cat's eyes, like, you know, news stories about cats, what people thought about cats throughout history, cats and art, when, you know, cats literally used to be gods, you know, and cats have never forgotten. They used to be worshipped as gods and goddesses. That's why, you know, they think they're like so, such awesome Creatures and I have this like funny little meme on my phone and this cat is like it's looking at someone's Instagram account. Oh, uh, I see the humans have all these thousands of pictures of me as well. They should like something to that effect because, oh, they're worshiping me the way I totally deserve to be. And oh, again, the freaking sticker is covering it. But it's, you know, since the dawn of civilization, felines have done something which I can't read, expanded their territory and spread the myth, myth of human greatness. And today, cats are peddled on social media as silly creatures here to amuse humans with their antics. But this is an absurd, self-centered fantasy. The true history of felines is one of heroism, love, tragedy, sacrifice, and gravitas. Not entirely convinced? Well, get ready, because Baba the Cat is here to set the record straight. 
spanning almost every continent and thousands, yes, thousands of years, Baba's complex story of feline survival presents readers with a diverse cast of cats long forgotten, from her prehistoric feline ancestors and the ancient Egyptian cat goddess Bastet, to the daring mar mariners at the height of oceanic discovery, key intellectuals of the Enlightenment period, revered heroes from World War Wars I and II, and even the infamous American tabbies. Baba, a talented model in addition to a scholar, goes beyond surface-level scratches, pairing her freshly unearthed research with a series of stunning costume portraits to bring history to life. A pause on journey through the Feline Hall of Fame with in-depth research and four-legged testaments that will make you rethink who defines history. A Cat's Tale is a, is a one-of-a-kind chronicle that introduces readers to the illustrious ancestors of their closest companions and shows, once and for all, that cats know exactly what they're doing. Oh, do they ever? And this also caught my eye because earlier this year I had read the Dewey, the biography of the extraordinary library cat or whatever it was called. He lived to be 18 years old. He was dropped in the library, like drop box in an, a small town Iowa library when he was about six weeks old in the middle of like an extremely frigid winter. And he became the library cat in the library and like took him home to live with her on the weekends and holidays when the library wasn't opening at all these like funny antics he became famous all over the world and finally when he got he got old and weak he like moved to living with the librarian at the end I cried at the end of that book when you know Dewey had to be put down that's one of the things that legitimately makes me cry reading about like news stories or in books like the death or the torture of an animal or animals being sick and suffering like you know I've long believed animals have greater souls than humans because they just love unconditionally they don't like care what color your skin is or your sexual orientation or your politics or anything about you all they care about is that you love them and treat them well and so Dewey was the legacy of the small town library cat who inspired millions includes new Dewey stories and other touching cat stories by Vicki Myron and Brett Witter author of the number one New York Times bestseller Dewey and it is this is a large print edition I didn't get that on purpose but that was you know what was available there and I guess that might be good for my eyes because as I've mentioned without my miracle sclera contacts I'm practically blind in my um, right eye unfortunately. Nine heartwarming stories about cats all told from the perspective of Dewey's mom librarian Vicki Myron. The amazing felines in this book include Dewey of course and several others who Vicki found out about when their owners reached out to her. Vicki learned how these cats fit into Dewey's community of perseverance and love from a divorced mother in Alaska who saved a drowning kitten to a troubled Vietnam veteran whose heart was opened by his long relationship with a rescued cat. These stories will inspire readers to believe in the magic of animals to touch individual lives. And this is the last one, which I got 102 minutes about the fall of the World Trade Center. I've been like watching a lot of documentaries lately about 9-11. They were like as recommended on the queue on television. I'm looking through similar things and then I'm researching as well because I just really didn't follow the news that much when it actually happened my senior year of university that's obviously a really really long personal story for another video but it was just like I had so many other things going on besides you know following the news and I was kind of blinded by my political hatred for like George Bush Jr. and all the decisions he made that were like you know the result like of what happened in 9-11 I just basically lost sight of the fact what what had actually happened I feel like you know reading and finally learning about this in depth after deliberately Avoiding it to my detriment is kind of my way of like atoning for what I realize now is like kind of like an insensitive like reaction I had to it but obviously that should be explored more in depth and oh and I'm also writing about it for my um, July camp nano project I jumped a little a few years ahead in my uh, magnum opus cinnamon to write about the 9-11 section in that um really really long 12 volume book I've had it memorized on backwards and forwards for many years and this is I feel you know like part of my atonement for just like not caring properly or just not following the news when it actually happened but I guess I can explore that more in a future video and a future um blog post and this is 102 minutes the unforgettable story of the fight to survive inside the twin towers and obviously it took 102 minutes for the first tower that was hit the north tower to fall with a new postscript on the 10th anniversary of 9-11 by Jim Dwyer and Kevin Flynn hailed upon its publication as an instant classic the critically acclaimed New York Times bestseller 102 minutes is now available in a revised edition that honors the 10th anniversary of the attacks of September 11 2001 at 8 46 a.m. that morning 14,000 people were inside the World Trade Center just starting their workdays over the next 102 minutes 
Each would become part of a drama for the ages. New York Times reporters Jim Dwyer and Kevin Flynn draw on hundreds of interviews with rescuers and survivors, thousands of pages of oral histories, and countless phone, email, and emergency radio transcripts to help tell the story of September 11th from the inside looking out. From the words and deeds of ordinary men and women, they weave an epic account of struggle, determination, and grace. In a new postscript, Dwyer and Flynn write movingly of the legacy of the attacks for those New Yorkers whose lives were forever altered on that day, and for all Americans who will never forget those 102 indelible minutes. And I'm kind of like having like really intense, unexpected physical reactions when I'm watching these documentaries, so maybe I did like feel like trauma and I just like pushed it off and was in denial of what, what I was actually like feeling and experiencing and now finally like my brain is like catching up and it's finally just like being released in this long delayed like emotional or traumatic reaction the brain is just like an amazing thing we'll never probably never really fully understand just like how it completely works and so um thank you guys very much for watching to the end like if you haven't already please consider um subscribing but i particularly like i'm um, seeing comments from these guys and even if you don't subscribe to my channel because i just like making more friends on booktube and authortube and having conversations with these guys like let me know what you thought of the books on my tv or list for, for the historathon and for the other books i showed afterwards and just like let me know like have you read them would you consider reading them and have any other suggestions for this um historathon and i will see you guys again very very soon thanks for watching bye